Well, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Stefan van der, Stefan, Stefan van der Walt. Um, he's a former colleague at Berkeley and a friend. Um, he's a senior research data scientist at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, which is funded by the Moore and Sloan Foundation, at least originally was. Um, and is the founder of Scikit Image, which is an open source project that is commonly used for things like machine learning for image classification and recognition. Um, he's also co author of Elegant SciPy, The Art of Scientific Python. And he's been developing scientific open source software for more than 15 years, um, focusing primarily on tools in the Python language. He's currently the director of NumFocus and serves on the steering committees of NumPy, SciPy, and Python Software and the Python Software Foundation Scientific Working Group. And these are just a few things out of the many that he's doing from what I remember while at Berkeley. So it's my pleasure to introduce Stefan and to um, introduce his talk, Open Data Science, Why Data Science Needs to Establish Open Practices and Culture. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Cyrus, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me as part of your symposium. So, I would not be giving this talk uh, today if it weren't for the great excitement that's recently built up uh, around data science. And not as much because I am a data scientist, but because I belong to a strange breed of programmers that write open source uh, software. So those who write open source software typic uh, typically do so in their spare time. And uh, once it's been shared for the world uh, for free, they eagerly respond to bug reports and feature requests. It's an odd job, but oddly satisfying. So when I started working on this type of software in the early 2000s, uh, there was no such thing as data science. But scientific uh, software was in demand, and the options were limited to commercial offerings or somewhat dysfunctional open source alternatives. And this bothered me a great deal for the reasons that should be become apparent uh, during this talk, and I set out to change it. We, and I say we because this really has to be a group endeavor because of the scale of it, uh, worked on building out uh, free scientific tools and the communities around it. And then data science became a thing. So with custom crafted software being central to this new movement approach discipline, uh, a lot of emphasis was placed uh, specifically on open source computing tools. This focus was a good thing. Um, and there are other encouraging points of light as well. Today, we'll tell you why this is a good start and why it should be the beginning of a greater movement towards openness. The thing is, we're just starting out now. So we're living in this early excitement of data science. We know there's something there. Uh, it's not quite engineering or statistics, but there's definitely something there. And we're, you know, we don't quite know how to describe it properly uh, yet. But uh, we know that it's uh, in its early stages and it's a time where the culture is being established. And, you know, the question is, what will that culture look like? Uh, will it be different from previous scientific fields? Or will we adopt more or less the same practices and develop the same flaws? Whatever data science is, its culture is bound to become more set eventually as things develop. And what that culture becomes will drastically influence the future of data science. So I'd like to take you with me now and travel into the future and see what data science could look like if we uh, were to establish a healthy culture. So imagine the year is 2040. Data science has grown to become a collaborative effort between multiple scientific disciplines. Many field experts consider themselves data scientists too. It's not an exclusive label after all. Perhaps more a way of thinking about and approaching your data. Training to be a data scientist involves knowing how to work with data, software, and statistics. And we typically acquire this knowledge through hands-on collaboration with one another. The focus is on understanding the problem and the data at hand, not on applying, uh, applying complicated models. Collaboration is the name of the game. And teams of data scientists, software developers, and field experts routinely cooperate, uh, often a mix of PIs, postdocs, graduate students, and other specialists. There's no distinction as such between 
data science, computer science, and statistics. These fields are more, uh, they, they more emphasize different angles uh, that you can take it looking at the same problems. Open source software is used to provide uh, transparent scientific software stacks, and no one would dream of building something as important as a scientific pipeline on a closed pa platform that cannot be inspected for mistakes. Open source teams are, uh, and open source software is being supported uh, through grants, perhaps on their own projects, on other people's projects, and universities acknowledging how science has become computational through and through, uh, support those who wish to contribute back to this essential backbone of science. Data science is rigorous, but it's not ultra competitive. Practitioners are aware of the biases in their algorithms, uh, and they work hard to understand and correct for those. There's a general sense of skepticism around computational results and complex models, uh, instead of just blindly trusting what is produced. And practitioners are careful uh, in how they apply uh, their work. Discoveries are peer published and employers value work on a broad spectrum of attributes, uh, publication being only one of them. So this future that I just sketched out. This future interests me. It's filled with collaboration, creativity, sharing, and it opens up so many different possibilities. It does feel different to me from the track that many scientific fields are currently on. And the surprising vision here is that science should be a collective effort. And philosophically speaking, I think most of us agree uh, that the human race should work together to unlock the secrets of the universe and to invent the mathematical tooling necessary to do so. But in practice, there are other factors that, that come into play. And I'm not dismissing those factors or pretending that they don't exist, but I'm arguing that we should argue against them and the impact that they can have on our work culture. So the future I just described uh, touches on various topics, and I'd like to unpack each of these individually. Perhaps the easiest to describe the widest of these is uh, open research itself. So it is evident that if your goal is to uncover the truth about the world, you cannot simply describe your findings. You have to be able to show evidence and to justify your assumptions. Uh, moreover, you need to allow other people to examine this evidence and to verify it for themselves. If we follow reasonable protocols in our investigations, then it matters less whether we are right or wrong. Um, and it should be no threat to us if others see what we've done. In fact, it should be encouraged. Now, I wonder how many of you have tried to replicate a paper. Almost invariably, it is very difficult to do. Uh, either the paper doesn't give enough details about the parameters used, the experiment, uh, experimental setup, um, et cetera, or perhaps the tools aren't available to do what you need to do. Uh, and, you know, this would be the barrier assuming that everything else had been done correctly and that there's no dishonesty involved. But even in those cases, replication is extremely hard. So, you know, as part of my, my work on scikit image, for example, I've implemented numerous uh, published algorithms, but even for papers that could be considered uh, purely mathematical, you run into some issues. You run into boundary conditions not being described or the figures not depicting what was discussed, uh, the test data, the code not being uh, available. And it can be hard to get even supposedly uh, very simple techniques to work. So, if that's the case there, now imagine you're talking about a neuroimaging paper that uses multiple sophisticated statistical techniques. It's applied to protected patient data. It's built on complex pipelines that mix interactive and non-interactive software, commercial and open source. There's just no way to, uh, to reproduce that. And uh, I think it seems like it would be best almost not to go there. A colleague of mine stated it well. He said, we know we will be wrong if we do everything perfectly and we don't do things perfectly. Show your work and at least we can get closer to doing it perfectly. Then we only have to contend with the fact that we don't have access to truth about the world. 
not having access to the truth about the world is a you know it's a big deal it's a, it's a lot to worry about so we really don't need to make our lives difficult um in any other ways okay so now we're talking about open research and i'm going to talk about two uh two aspects of open research open software and open data so data science often involves the exploration of complex data sets and it requires versatility in modeling solutions, uh, also an ability to adapt very, very rapidly to newly posed problems. So interactive, expressive languages like Python um, are ideal for this purpose. But what should these software pipelines look like? So this is, this is my idea of what, what good uh, scientific software looks like. I described it in a recent blog post if you want to read more. Um, I think it's it's crucial that software should be tested. In other, word, in other words, for every piece of code you have, there should be another piece of code that verifies that functionality. It should be documented both for your own benefit, but also for the benefit of others who may want to use the software. And it needs to be reviewed. Multiple pairs of eyes help us to catch errors in our code. It should be built on open and free infrastructure so that the code can be inspected. The whole stack can be inspected all the way down. And as we develop the history, the prov provenance of the project should be, uh, should be tracked so that we can see, for example, when variables have changed or when new ideas were introduced. And then ultimately it should be published uh, in the open under a liberal open source license or ideally developed in the open as you're going along. So for me, these are requirements of good open software, but then there are some ideals we can aspire to as well. I think software should aim to be simple because you know code is hard enough to debug as it is and uh, there's a story that debugging is twice as hard as it is to write the code so if you write code at your absolute capacity you won't be able to debug it. but we try to keep things simple and expressive um, everything that can be automated should be automated there's this idea of kaizen you know you improve your process over and over um, and eventually you have pipelines that run and you improve the pipeline. So you know, all your figures, all the byproducts, everything is generated uh, automatically. Testing is run automatically and so forth. Uh, you want to keep your code readable and consistent. And the reason that we keep code readable is because it turns out that code is read much more often than what it is written. And if others want to contribute to your project, well, then they need to be able to, to read your code. And consistency is more or less like when you write a paper. You don't want multiple voices. You want the, the software, just like the paper, to have a single voice that's expressed. Um, and then next, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the reusability of software, which is very important in science. So Gael Varaku published this uh, paper about reusability of software. And he makes the important point that reproducibility in itself is not all that helpful. So we can achieve reproducibility trivially. We can take the box that the code is running on when we finish the experiment and we can put it in an Arctic vault somewhere. So there we go. If ever we need to run the code again, we just take the machine out, we run it again. Um, not that helpful. A more modern equivalent of that might be to package everything into a Docker container and just push the Docker container up into the cloud, done. Good, but not that helpful because in the end, the goal is to retarget this code perhaps to new data, to new experiments. So we should aim to build software that other people can also use in their research. And I think in the end, the algorithms that are shared this way uh, and are maintained are the ones that will influence the conversation in the future. They're the ones that, go, that, that will be used uh, in research. If you're not able to develop uh, you can still be a good citizen. So here are different ways of participating in, in open source software. Um, I think the most important step is to start by envisioning that you might want to uh, publish this code when you start writing the code. Because just that act of thinking, um, you know, I may make this available to the public, changes completely your relationship to the code. You take better care of, um, of the code as you develop it. You document it better, etc. So it just that act in itself changes the quality. Um, of course, being able to contribute back is great and it's helpful, it's probably educational. And importantly, if you contribute back to open source software, 
you will uh, partly inherit this culture associated with open source software, which is of high quality co-development. It is amazing the number of experts you find out there who really know what they're doing in this field and working with them is just a privilege and a, and a, and a true joy. If you can't help develop, uh, you can still, like I said, be a good citizen. So you can cite software appropriately when you use it. And if possible, you can perhaps add a, a grant line item or you can hire programmers. There are other ways to contribute too. So uh, here's the other aspect of open research I mentioned, open data. And you'll see this image of a prickly pear here. Now, why do I have the prickly pear here? Um, I think many of us remember the first time we interacted with this object. It's a, it's a tricky fruit. Like, you know, you, you know it's gonna be juicy and it's tasty and it's colorful and it's beautiful. But if you pick it up without thinking, you get in trouble. So uh, in the same sense, data sharing is a, is a little bit like that. It's a thorny issue. Um, it's great if you can get people to do it. It helps tremendously with reproducibility and calibration of algorithms. Uh, but the incentives, I feel, aren't yet that well aligned. You know, consider that you often pay a lot of money to gather data, and that with, that's regardless of whether you gather it in the field or from an MRI scanner, whatever the case might be. Um, and then this data is kind of the gold mine that produces those very valuable publications that academia runs on. So why would you give away this very valuable asset? Well, there are several motivations. So I think, you know, thinking again from the broad universal perspective in how we do science, um, it does improve efficiency, the more data that we can get out there. You can imagine, you know, you're studying a biomarker, you want to know the effectiveness of this thing um, on an entire population, but you only have students between the age of 20 and 25 to do your experiments, so, or to do your measurements on. So, you know, it doesn't really generalize, but if a lot of people open up their data sets, it broadens the scope of the investigation you can do. Um, but even more locally, you know, if, if you publish your paper and you don't open the data, there's very little chance that other people can verify the work that you've done. And also having data out there assist with new tool development. You can write a library and make sure that it runs on typical data from that field. The advantages for the person opening up the code, well, here's where we come to the little bit of a prickly pear situation. The incentives aren't that well aligned. So uh, again, as with software, if you know that you're going to publish a data set, you will take a lot more care in the way you gather it. You'll probably have better metadata and so forth. Um, you may be able to get some citations if you publish the data product, it's okay. And then perhaps you'll do it to satisfy some grant to general requirements. That's not very satisfying. So uh, in summary on open research, uh, I wanna point out this paper by Ioannidis where he says that most published research findings are false. And he's, he's got a pretty good argument for why he thinks that's the case. Um, and he says these two things, the, the greater the financial and other interests and prejudices in a scientific field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. And the hotter a scientific field with more scientific teams involved, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Uh, it's a kind of scary for fields where there's a lot going on. Uh, I highly recommend reading that paper. So uh, in summary, I think, you know, get your mindset, your mindset should be right. And from the beginning, you should keep in mind that people may want to use your code or your data. It might be you a few weeks from now, or it may be someone else. Uh, for example, when I write a piece of code uh, that I think is going to end up in a library, it's very different from when I write a piece of throwaway experimental code. I keep detailed notes, I document my steps, I write documentation, um, I add doc strings, tests, etc. cetera. Um, and these things are very hard to retrofit. So much easier to start thinking that way from the beginning. Then try to be transparent, uh, use easily accessible open source software and provide your source code and the data so that others can try it, can learn from it and potentially can build on it. And perhaps most importantly is don't fool yourself. We, it's so easy to fool yourself. And um, you know, we should remind ourselves constantly that this is a pursuit of the truth and we should avoid shortcuts that affect that negatively. Uh, 
I recall I was working as a postdoc on uh, a paper. It was close to submission time and I discovered a bug in our code and it made our results worse. So I phoned up my collaborator and explained the situation to him. And it was remarkable how convinced he was that the bug wasn't really a bug and whatever I, I discovered wasn't real. Um, you know, just because the incentives, incentives were not uh, aligned with that. So it's very easy to, uh, to justify correctness when, even when you know otherwise. So, you know, when you're looking for something, it's, mu it's much more likely to find it. So be aware of that and, um, you know, try and convince yourself that, that uh, the results are correct. So, okay, so how do we make all of this work uh, practically? We basically have to find uh, incentives and align them uh, with the outcomes that we desire. So it must make sense for people to share data, to share code, and to do research out in the open. And until we align those uh, incentives well and find low friction models, I think we may be fight fighting an uphill battle. But there are examples out there of where this is attempted. So um, you can, at the moment, you can already publish software as as uh, papers in certain journals, and you can also publish your, uh, your data and software artifacts. Uh, for example, you can go on uh, GitHub and use a Nodo and get a DOI that can be, that can be cited. All right, so let's move on. Uh, we have now touched a little bit on, on publishing, so I want to go into a little bit more detail on open publishing. And a theme here that I haven't expanded on is that a lot of healthy systems out there um, are run by communities. So there's something interesting that happens when communities take control over their own commons. It is meaningful to them and they take good care of it and they teach one another to take good care of this commons of theirs and to be good at whatever is required to maintain it. It's very hard, for example, um, to take part in a high quality open source project and to then fall back on your old development practices. Once you've seen these better practices, uh, you cannot and you certainly do not want to unsee them. But publishing is strange. It's one of the most important activities in the scientific endeavor and yet we have readily uh, given it up into the hands of, uh, of others mostly. And I wouldn't say that those people always have our community's best interests at heart. Here's one of the first scientific uh, uh, journals. It's the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And this was published by Oldenburg, the secretary at the time. And he published it at his own personal expense, but he had this agreement with the Royal Society that he would uh, get the resulting profits. So you can see what he was thinking, um, but he was to be disappointed. He earned very little from this endeavor and turns out he was barely able to cover his uh, rent on his house in Piccadilly. But in a sense, that's not such a terrible story, right? That's kind of what you want to happen. Like there shouldn't be obscene profits coming from uh, disseminating our work. But then you look at the parent company of Elsevier uh, and you see that, you know, they're talking about revenues of around $10 billion in 2019, of which Elsevier contributed about a third um, and we're talking about profit margins of 30%. It's, it's a lot of money. And it seems that like there's a massive misalignment of incentives between uh, the scientific endeavor and publishing houses. Authors want to get their work disseminated as widely as possible, but publishing houses want to keep things closed and they want to keep their uh, customers. So they want to keep things closed so the customers will keep uh, coming back uh, to see their content. So how much does it cost to actually publish a paper? I think a case study would be just the Journal of Open Source Software. Um, of course, it depends a lot on what you get for free. Uh, so the, the reviews are typically free, yes, but you know all the big publishers get the reviews for free too. And so it mainly comes down to things like editor time and infrastructure cost. So the Journal of Open Source Software has a blog where they outline their costs and they currently operate less than five US dollars per paper. So, okay, this includes a whole bunch of volunteer time. So that's, that's fairly cheap. But even without that volunteer effort, they calculate numbers of around 100, 150 US dollars per paper. 
we can easily pay for that ourselves and we probably should uh, because as a community we have to realize that we currently pay way more than that i think uh open access papers can cost on the order of five thousand dollars a paper nowadays it's just a, it's a lot and we pay for the subscription of the journals etc it's a it's a lot of money going into it so there are alternative models out there. Here I show you the index of the sci-fi conference proceedings of 2009. And uh, this, pr these proceedings were founded by uh, Jared Millman and by Gail Baraku. And I joined them later and I helped to rewrite the tooling for, uh, for doing the proceedings. And what's interesting about this proceedings is that it's fully handled on GitHub. So if you write a paper for the proceedings, you write it in plain text, in, in restructured text, and you upload this as a pull request to, uh, to the SciPy conference uh, repository. Um, every time you make a change to your paper, it's recompiled and the PDF is served up on a special website where reviewers can access it. Uh, but what I really love about the system is that the reviews are conversations. It's not a one so you know, you did this wrong, go and fix it, and then maybe you can publish your paper. It's really a conversation. And when we talk to the reviewers, we instruct them that the conversation should be, uh, the nature of the conversation should be that you want to help the authors to get their papers accepted into, into the proceedings. So it's really a, almost a collaborative effort between the reviewer and the author, trying to get the paper um, in as good a state as possible by the end date so that we can decide whether or not to in include it. So I find that quite a friendly and encouraging environment to work in. Um, so yeah, just as with uh, Joss, you know, we wrote all the software uh, in-house and it's, it's not that crazy to do. But nowadays there are other implementations that are really well done, well polished that, that you can use to, um, to do that yourself. And the one I, I mentioned here is uh, from Casey Green's lab, it's called uh, Manubot. So just in summary about publishing, I'd say, you know, always try and publish in open journals, but even if you can't negotiate for open access otherwise, and if you're lucky, you work for an institute like uh, the UC, uh, the University of California that has negotiated on, our, on the behalf of all the employees that their work can be published out in the open. The next open I want to talk about is uh, open education. And I put open in quotes here and, and expand on it a little bit because I, I mean something slightly different from open dissemination here. Um, I mean open as in opening a box. So, you know, opening a box, illuminating what's inside, providing insight and giving experience to the teaching matter at hand. Um, not, to, not to say that open dissemination isn't important. I, I love efforts like Khan Academy, for example. I think they may have single-handedly taught my son how to read. Um, I'm very fond of what they do. Uh, but here I just want to discuss, discuss a slightly uh, different aspect. So th this study is incredible to me. So it's uh, significance testing as perverse probabilistic reasoning published by Westover et al. And what they did here is they went to a bunch of uh, medical practitioners who use statistics in their day-to-day -day work. So it's really important for, for what they do every day. And they asked them this question. So they said, consider a typical medical research study, uh, for example, designed to test the efficacy of a drug in which a null hypothesis, hypothesis H0 has um, the, the no effect hypothesis is tested against an alternative hypothesis. There is some effect. And suppose that the study results passes a test of statistical significance, i.e. p-value of less than 0.05 in favor of H1. What has just been shown? And then they give seven options. And I also show the responses here. And if you look at that table, you can see it's kind of spread all over the place. And this is for people who know their statistics quite well. They work with it every day. They interpret these kinds of results regularly. And yet there's a lot of confusion about what exactly the answer to this question is. So, you know, the paper argues that the answer should be seven, but you shouldn't feel bad if you get it wrong because so did a lot of, a lot of experts. And I think this just goes to show that there's 
there's a lot of confusion about uh, statistics and how to be interpreted. So if you read the kinds of papers uh, I enjoy reading, then you'd think that we're doing a pretty terrible job at teaching statistics. Uh, look at this one. So failing grade, 89% of introduction to psychology textbooks that define or explain statistical significance do so incorrectly. Uh, you know, modern statistics education, and of course this varies a lot across the board and a lot of people are doing a great job with this, but it feels to me that a lot of modern education is like this car. Um, you know, you open the, the, the hood and then underneath it, there's this beautiful engine, but you really can't see what's going on in there. Um, my dad at some point, the, uh, his job got him a new car and uh, you know, with this fancy car, we went on a holiday and the car broke down. And then uh, we, you know, with our previous cars, we would open the car up and look what's wrong and, and, and try and fix it. But with this car, you ended up in this situation. It was just plastic cover. And turns out when uh, the mechanics came to fix it, what they do is they take out a proprietary computer, they plug in a cable, it does some analysis, and everything works magically again. Um, it's not the the kind of situa situation we want to be in with statistics education. Um, my, uh, my wife, when we started uh, dating, I obviously wanted to impress her. And one way I thought I could do that was to help with uh, statistics homework. So, you know, I didn't know anything about statistics at the time. So this didn't seem like a, like a very good idea. But I figured out pretty quickly that, you know, you take the textbook, you find some formulas, they give you a problem. There are some numbers in the problem. And you just have to mix and match until you get them right plug them in, look up the number in the table, give the result, and you're good to go. And the fact that I was able to complete so many of those uh, problems without knowing anything um, is, uh, was, was not a good sign. So I think we should go back into the future. So we should go back to a place where we really can look under the hood at the, at the algorithms and the mechanisms that we use and, you know, if we open up the bonnet of this car, we should be able to see, you know, the components, the radiator belt, the spark plugs, the water, the oil. Um, but you can see what's going on there. Nothing is hidden. And statistics education should help students to gain insight into how things work. We shouldn't hide details um, and simply teach application of black boxes. But there's good news. Uh, and that is that there are ways of teaching uh, like that. And, you know, these new ways to teach statistics ironically are often very old. It's just that they have become much more viable nowadays because we have much increased computational power. One of those techniques is uh, resampling. And using resampling, you would basically model the world in terms of uh, dice and then you know, use multiple dice if you need to. You'd throw those dice over and over, you'd count what you get, and you would think about what that means. And it turns out that this very simplistic mechanism can be used to, to um, uh, model a bunch of very complicated statistical uh, algorithms, uh, t-tests, analysis of variance, etc. So in that line, uh, Matthew Brett and I are reviewing a book by Julian Simon, the late Julian Simon, uh, resampling the new statistics. And we're updating that book for modern programming languages. And we'll be reworking the content a little bit um, and that would be our attempt uh, to, to contribute to this new uh, type of education. I think for those of you who are interested in resampling statistics, there's a fantastic lecture by Jake Vanderplas that was given at PyCon 2016, Statistics for Hackers, and I recommend that you look that up. So then lastly, I would say that there's still great value in disseminating high value, high, quali uh, high quality educational material. And I think a prime example of that is the textbook used at Berkeley for Data 8, the introductory data science course uh, by Anya Dakari and John De Niro, computational and inf uh, inferential thinking. And we could definitely do with more of these kinds of uh, sources of education. In this book, they, they also make very sure that the students get uh, hands-on exposure to real data and that the data is matched up with the problem very closely. Another effort at uh, Berkeley was this uh, teaching computational re uh, reproducibility class by uh, Milman, Brett, Bernofsky, and uh, Boleyn. 
And what they did here was they gave a bunch of students, I crossed out the four neuroimaging because they used neuroimaging data sets, but it was a general class. And what they did was they gave students access to open, open data sets, and then they asked them to either reproduce a paper or to investigate some element of that paper and uh, do an analysis around it. Talk a little bit more about this uh, paper later on, but I think this was a very interesting experiment that they did with making students do high quality work. One of my own efforts at Berkeley is uh, the, the Berkeley Institute for Data Science machine shop. And in the machine shop, I take small teams of students and I have them work on uh, actual research projects. And the example that I show you here was done with uh, a few undergraduate research assistants. And we developed a pipeline for the Natural History Museum in London that would take uh, these photos that came from their vast collection of butterflies and it would analyze the picture. It would first locate the butterfly, it would then locate the ruler, and on the butterfly body it would find certain key points, and then uh, it would, using the ruler, translate those key points into measurements, wing length, body length, uh, etc. And this is a pipeline that was developed predominantly by students, and it is currently in active use at the uh, Natural History Museum to accelerate uh, their uh, data processing pipeline. I think this morning uh, I, saw, I, I saw Arlo on the program, so he might have spoken about the data science discovery program, another effort at, at Berkeley to match students to real world uh, data science problems. I think this is so fantastic, you know, to, to bring students into the fold of research and to have them participate on a real scientific problem. I think you learn so much in that way. So I, I just think this kind of model um, of working, collaborating with students on a problem. It's one of the best ways we can teach. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the open culture sections that I wanted to discuss. The last section I want to, uh, the last topic I want to mention then is uh, collaboration. And arguably collaboration is one of the most important things that we should talk about. Um, You'll notice that in at least two of the previous topics, collaboration played a major role in open source software and in hands-on education. So I focus on collaboration because I think A, it makes our work uh, a lot better and B, it's also just a lot more fun. You know, we're social beings and we enjoy doing this together. So what I'm going to propose here as a way of doing science, it's, uh, it's not radical, and it's certainly not new, um, especially outside of science, but I've not seen it applied all that much within science. So let's call it uh, for now, focused collaborative iteration um, or agile science, because this is essentially the exact model between, uh, behind agile software development as popularized by Jeff Sutherland and others. So what would this model look like? Well, I would say you take a very clearly defined problem goal, and then you form a small team, four to six members. And the teams would consist of a mix of project experts. So you'll have, for example, a domain expert, a software expert, computational expert, et cetera. And then you put a strict time limit on the project. And from each member of, of the team, you would ask a daily commitment. And the daily commitment would be four hours of dedicated focused work. No Facebook, no browsing, nothing. You're going to sit and with a team, you're going to think about this problem. And you're going to do in-depth discussion of any of the roadblocks that come up and you're going to work to uh, dislodge those, those roadblocks. And in that process, the team members will educate one another about their various expertise and the domains that they come from. We will, um, in this model, you directly address problems with all the various skilled hands on deck as they arise. So you do that and you iterate day over day over day. So what I really like about this model is that it requires relatively few resources. Yes, there's the time commitment and it's fairly high, but it's only for a few months. Uh, you rapidly converge towards success or to failure. So in either case, you didn't waste all that much time. Uh, there are no more handoff costs. So you don't have a group gathering the data, then another group analyzing it, 
another group doing something else. No hand of co costs involved. Um, and the expertise required in any stage of the pipeline is, is available throughout. So, I, you know, with image processing, I often run into this. People bring me a data set and say, can you apply some algorithms to, you know, get us whatever we need? Um, and you look at the data and you realize it's just terrible. You know, if, if you asked me this question before you started taking photos or videos, we could have changed the lighting, we could have changed the setup, we could have uh, normalized the angle of the camera, et cetera. Um, but typically the domain experts don't know that until they get to the image processing experts in that scenario. So in this model, everyone's there the whole time. Um, the, if, if the project goes well, then you'll have publishable, publishable work after a very short period of time. Um, and you will have a cross-trained team, people who know much more about what the other people in the team do. And as a team, they could potentially iterate much faster on a future problem. And via team discussions, I bet that a bunch of ideas will arise for a future project. Now, contrast this against, you know, a massive grant with unknowable uncertainty in the face of long timelines uh, requiring big organizational efforts and that suffers from delays in communication and availability. This just you know, seems uh, much more fun and interesting to me. So we know that this method is viable. Referring back to the Milman et al. Uh, paper about the, uh, the computational reproducibility course that they taught at Berkeley, um, this is essentially the model that they followed with the students. And that shows us that it can be taught in a course even. Those students were able to do significant amounts of code. They wrote tests. They used revision control. Um, they automated everything. So they did very high quality work in this kind of framework. I think we also have a sense that, you know, review, as with software, it improves scientific work. And, you know, lots of eyes just help us to, to spot bugs and uh, to, to bring in new, new ideas. So I think this model, as a social working group, uh, will not only make work more enjoyable, but it should also lead to very high quality work. All right, so that's, uh, that's a proposal for a way that we could do uh, our data science work. I'll then end with the following. So I'll say, you know, data science is in its infancy, it's young. You and I will shape its culture. Uh, let that culture be open and let's do it all together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan, for that inspiring talk. It was, it was really cool to see. Um, so we have some great questions so far, so I'll, I'll just kick it off with a few of those. Um, so one uh, participant asked, spaces like Stack Overflow have modes of operating that can be intimidating for contributing to a community. Do you have recommendations about how to encourage friendly, informative interactions on open source projects? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we've run into that ourselves, and I think in the end, you know, as long as you rely on an external platform to provide the culture for your project, you will run into this issue. So what uh, what we've done with Scikit Image is we've joined in with numerous other projects in the biological uh, imaging space, and we've set up a forum ourselves. And the advantage of doing that is you can basically direct how the conversations go and you can uh, moderate the conversations uh, much better. I think on Stack Overflow, it's often very focused on, you know, getting the right answer as quickly as possible, but there's some rudeness involved that can be quite off-putting. And um, we, I think, project leaders are very important in establishing culture. So the first person, the person that starts the project or the few people that start working on it first, they often set the tone for the rest of the project. So that's you, you can influence the project by, by starting from the beginning to be extremely friendly and accommodating. But then, yeah, with cases like forums, you'll uh, probably have to make your own if you want to uh, set that culture in those spaces. Awesome, thank you. Um... Another audience member asks, asks, do you think there's any value in some kind of governance structure for data science? For example, it'd be nice to have someone provide guidelines for universities for tenure and promotion criteria. And I'll add to that, how have you seen this working out in your experience and how, how do you find that this would be feasible? 
That is a, <laughs> that's a difficult question. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I work with governance structures all the time because obviously in open source, uh, we have these structures, but it's a little bit different. There, there are no universities involved. And that's what I mentioned back in the talk. When, when a community owns its commons, then you can make it a very nice place to hang out in. When Eleanor Ostrom studied this, and it's, uh, it's worth reading her work, and maybe also uh, Nadia Egbol's work on, on working in open, she talks a whole lot about this. Um, but, you know, they basically have a list of characteristics that make spaces interesting and friendly and fun and collaborative to work in. I think it's very hard to do that for data science because who owns data science? I mean, data science, it's, a, it's such a mishmash of things and it's so different at the various places that I think there's no governing body and there's, there's no agreement about who owns the space. It would be very hard to uh, write up a set of governance uh, documents that everyone agree could agree on and it would be very hard to enforce it. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess you've stumped me with that question. I don't have a very good answer, sorry. It's a tough one. Um, I'm gonna ask two questions that are, I'm gonna group two questions together that are related. Um, mm -hmm. One here is how do you deal with the ongoing problem of open source attracting bad actors who want to exploit the data for less than ethical purposes? And then as a follow on question, another one that came up is, how do you deal with financial success and um, how essentially, you know, the moral hazard or profit imperative that can come from that? Um, and they give an example of MakerBot. I'm not familiar with the MakerBot story. I'm also not familiar with the financial success. So you may have to expand on both. Um, but let, so let's start with the bad actors. Uh, it's, <laughs> It's a tough question, right? So you, you spend your life writing this library and then you find out that it's been used to target missiles or to design a bomb or whatever uh, in the most extreme cases. And it's, uh, it's a bit disheartening. But then, you know, you have, to, you have to also be practical about it. Like, are you going to be able to, you know, what can you do as an open source project to stop those things from happening or to stop your software from being used? Um, and it, it is a philo philosophical conundrum. I think what we've decided in the Python ecosystem especially, I mean, this, this comes up on a much smaller and maybe less aggressive scale with, uh, with companies wanting to exploit software. And there are licenses like GPL that tries to tightly control how you use the software. And we just found that, you know, the agony and the anguish that goes into trying to prohibit people from using your software in certain ways, uh, it really takes away from the project in, uh, to such an extent that we've made everything available under BSD licenses. So, you know, every, everyone can, can use and modify it. And I know there are projects that, that try and be very explicit about how they want their software to be used. They write pamphlets and letters and so forth. Uh, but ultimately, I think the problem isn't that our library that we wrote in our spare time is used for these purposes. I think, you know, governments and other entities um, have the resources to duplicate these things if they really want to. So I don't think we'll achieve all that much by getting it out of their hands. Um, but I think we, we should definitely express in public, you know, our views about the things that we, that we disagree with. Um, but for mechanisms, I think it's more painful to put those walls in place and to maintain them. Ultimately, you know, open source is still a volunteer effort. And over the years, it's become more and more onerous for maintainers because it's no longer just something you do over weekends. Now you have uh, customers, clients that you support. You've got, uh, you know, governance that you need to manage. There's a whole bunch of layers that have been piled on top of, of open source that made these small um, amateur projects become something fairly formal uh, that you that you had to to structure and maintain so in this case i'd say it's probably not all that much that we can do um cyrus can you uh, can you clarify the second question for me 
Well, another example of this I would think of is there's some open source projects that have been bought by large corporations. I think mm. even, isn't, hasn't GitHub even been one of those? And I guess I wonder if that affects the work or the thought process as far as these volunteer areas where, you know, individual people are putting a lot of their time and volunteer work into it. Yeah, so, so GitHub was always a closed platform, but it was acquired by, by Microsoft recently. But uh, there are certainly examples of, of uh, companies that have taken over software or that tried to develop software in an open way. And it, it is a very tricky area to manage. So, um, you know, we, we do have uh, contributors from, from industry to a lot of projects and it's remarkable the difference between those who get it and those who don't. So you, you can be a very good or a very, very bad player in that, in that system ecosystem. And basically what you see from good players is they understand that, um, you know, A, the community will make the decisions on what happens uh, B, the timelines are very different from what they are in, in industry. And that C, you can't really buy a feature being included. You have to work with the community to, uh, to get those things uh, built into, into the project. But it is undeniable that bad actors can, can disrupt these things. And you know, perhaps to some degree we've been lucky, but I think also, again, comes back to that licensing issue by rather uh, pulling people into the fold and educating them about what it means to be a good player, you can get more people to be good players. And then ultimately, you know, you have your governance and so on to fall back on if things uh, really go badly. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so another question from the audience. Um, how important is it to get funding agencies like the NSF and DOE on board with funding priorities that support openness and reproducibility? And any thoughts on how we can do this or how this is being done? Yeah, that's a great question and a really important one. I mean, at the moment, what we see is that government support is lagging behind quite a bit and that the foundations are doing a lot of the work in supporting open source software. I think there was optimism initially that industry would realize what an important role open source plays in, in the, for their companies and would find ways to contribute back. But by and large, that hasn't happened. And again, I'll say there are exceptions of companies who truly do uh, amazing open source work, but I don't think that's, that's the standard. Um, universities and governments should by now realize that there's a change afoot and that software is at the core of the next wave of research. All research is slowly becoming computational. And if you do not support these fundamental libraries, uh, you're gonna run into trouble um, and it, it, it won't take much. So yeah, I think, uh, I think you know, there, there needs to be a big shift. We've seen you know, people like Fernando Perez and others have done a great job at, at uh, explaining these things and giving talks about, about why it's so important. And then we see programs like the CISE from the NSF coming up recently um, that you know, allow us to get funding for, for some of the software. But I think there's still something being missed there that is captured quite nicely in the Chan Zuckerberg Institute's um, EOSS program, the Essentials of Open Source Software. So what they do is they have this program that is for funding maintenance of software. And that is something that you just cannot imagine seeing that included on, on a government grant very easily. And until we can you know, really understand that without maintenance, not just building new features, but without maintenance, uh, these projects can't survive. There's a, there's a beautiful, um, <clears throat> I think it was X, XKCD recently where they showed you know, the whole world's infrastructure of software is built upon like this tiny little wobbly library maintained by a single person up north in Canada or somewhere. And that is, in a sense, the situation we're, we're based on, uh, based in. Uh, NumPy is a good example. Until a few years ago, um, you know, we, we were able to recently revive the community and to, and to greatly uh, increase activity on that project. But five years ago, we were talking about three, four, five developers uh, developing a library that's being used by uh, by millions of people. So yeah, you ask me how to change that, talk to your program directors, talk to the people you know at the various institutions, um, explain in your grants why these things are important, keep trying, keep pushing the barriers, and uh, let's hope that that message gets heard.
Thank you. So this question is the other side of the coin of that first question about intimidating um, platforms and things like that. So this um, audience member asks, I don't have much experience in contributing to open source work. What is your recommendation to prepare for such work? What are your favorite, favorite platforms? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, that question reminds me a little bit of myself when I uh, try and, and start a new hobby. I always think, well, I probably need all the right tools and then I probably need to read all the books. And then, you know, so I work myself up for this and it's like months in preparation. Then when I get there, I realize, oh, well, this, none of this was really necessary. And I think, you know, with open source, it's the same. Uh, just go out there and get started. And the way you get started is basically you go to a project, preferably one that you use so that you know, um, you know, what it's all about and, and where the problem areas are. And, uh, you know, as you use this project or try this project, you will run into bugs. You will notice that things are not documented. You will very quickly uncover that, you know, whatever package you choose, it's not polished everywhere. And I think most of us started that way. You know, you, you get interested in the package, you start contributing on small things, you get roped into conversations, you start taking on more ambitious things as you go along. Um, and it doesn't really matter, you know, what, what the first pull request is. The, the important thing is stick with the process, stick with the community, try and get involved in the conversation because this really is, it's a social, it's a social endeavor. And it's not like, you know, a single pull request. I'm not saying it doesn't have any value, but averaging, uh, it doesn't matter all that much, but your participation in a community can be hugely valuable and it can be in so many different roles because we see people contributing, not only in terms of code and documentation, these easy things, but also governance and uh, project management and those forums that we discussed before, you can you know, help people have healthy conversations. You can, you can help uh, spread the word about the project. There's so much to do and so few people to do it. I think you will find a very receptive audience for whatever energy you have to contribute back. Well, I think that was the perfect way to end this talk, Stefan. Thank you so much for your hour and for the great time you put into this presentation. It was really fascinating and informative. Um, so I just want to give Stefan a, a round of applause. Thank him for, for his time and his work in open source. Thank, Thank you. you, Cyrus, and everyone. It was good to spend this hour with you. Thank you so much.